If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Let's talk about falling asleep during the uh, Nirvana season. Where did you fall asleep? I turned in about 40 minutes late, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I fell asleep, like, I think probably halfway through. So I think... Okay. Uh, I think it was after the EC3 Briscoe match. I thought that was a really good match, actually. No. I really enjoyed that match. It was uh, really... Um, now, some people I've spoken to said that they had, uh, you know, they liked it, but it would have been so much better with a live crowd. I tend to agree. If that had a live crowd, that probably would have delivered as probably like one of the best matches of the year because it just it was really intense that match. I thought. Oh yeah, it was absolutely really intense. I mean, the Briscoes are known for their intense style, and yep. you have one like EC3 who has really ever since his release from WWE has been able to be himself again. And the whole control your narrative movement is awesome. Um, I think he's doing really great things. And I think he's finally somewhere where someone realizes, Hey, this is what we have. Let's let him do this thing. And I think he's going to shine. I think so too. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, cause he's, this is only a second match, right? In the ring of honor. Uh, during this period, I think so. I think that's. I mean, if you look at him, because I think this is he came out in full gear in his regular, you know, wrestling gear. He's in tremendous shape. Like this is what he's been doing since being laid off, or actually even sitting and catering for God knows how long. But since being let go from WWE, he's just like gotten himself. Like he looks in kick ass shape. He's just insane looking. Yeah, if you actually, if you follow him on Instagram, if you go on his Instagram, every day he's always posting, like, Cement Factory and his workouts, and even, like, someone like Drake Maverick and Moose yep. and all people are following in his footsteps. Like, even somebody like Moose has gotten in tremendous shape. Yes. Uh, he, he's, he's po- actually, he's posted pictures with Drake Maverick, uh, while Drake, while Drake is still in uh, WWE, and I'm wondering what else they're going to do with him, as far as uh, you know, where 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 they're going to um, put him in Ring of Honor. Like, what's next for him? This match was pretty. This match was pretty fucking great. I thought so. And what direction are they going to go in after this? I mean, I think it's a little bit confusing, but. The dude's worked his ass off for years. Yes. Totally deserves to be in the spot he's in, you know. He went to the promised land after being realistically one of those newer breakout homegrown impact talents. And I mean, you would think after what WWE, you know, did with Derek Bateman back when NXT was the game show. And seeing what he did after right. to when Drew McIntyre was released and went and made a name for himself, they would have capitalized and they made a big deal out of his debut. And then it was just like, oh, hey, and it's the same thing with Eric Young. Oh, hey, we're just going to use you to put over people. And it's like, or we're not going to use you at all. And there's no right. point. Um, I'd like to see him rack up some wins. I think if they play their cards right, he could definitely be a world title. Okay. But again, it's one of the things, you know, where you got to do the work. And, you know, I really think if he puts in the work and 
based off his match the other night. They can put him in the title picture if he racks up enough wins. One of the things that they do, WWE, is uh, they like to sign people so that no other promotion will actually sign them. And so they'll just hire them and then let them sit at home or sit in catering or just have them come in and job them out every now and again. So I haven't sit at home for months. It's, I mean, they're still collecting pay, so, but I just find it ridiculous because some of these guys just really want to work, but at the same time. I mean, like, look at, look at Brody Lee. He sat home for months and months and months. He yeah, goes, almost... this AEW you totally kills it. And I think the Dark Order was really lacking that something. And then mm-hmm. you put Brody in, it's like, holy shit, this is incredible. Yeah. And even the stuff on yeah. BTE... And, you know, then unfortunately he passes away so young because of his health issues. And it was one of those things where I wonder where if he had gotten released sooner and gone to AEW sooner, you know, I think he could, even though he had a really impressive run. He he could have it was more. short, but it was very impressive. It was very enjoyable. It's too bad that he passed it, you know, so early getting in there. Um. So, like you, Northeast Wrestling shows, so you know all about Vincent, Matt Taven. Yes. I remember when Vincent used to be Vinny, I think, Marsala. I don't know how to pronounce yep. it right. It's Vinny Marsala, I think. Like the chicken. He's got a really good thing going. Like His whole character and the way he carries himself... I think he's got a good thing going. I think with this feud between him and Taven and everything that's happened, the unsanctioned match, it was a nice blow-off. I don't know where they're going to go with it, but it's kind of one of those things where as far as the way it was filmed, for a cinematic match especially, I don't think the production value was that great. I thought it was uh, pretty horrific, to be honest with you. Um, Not that we haven't seen, say, like empty arena matches and such, or I'm not a fan of the cinematic business. Uh, I don't know how you feel about cinematic matches. I can, I find them horrific. Uh, It's just, you know, when it comes to professional wrestling, I like a traditional style. So when it comes to, cinematic and all that other crap I just I find it wretched and this I mean there were some really bad spots and I think Taven broke his wrist coming down didn't he come off the balcony from what he, I understand he landed really bad on his wrist so um, you go back and you watch I actually watched the spot over a few times you like see him get pushed off the balcony kind of carelessly and I'm just kind of like and you see, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I know who you're referring to. I just, like you said, I can't remember. I'm out and push him off the balcony. And then, like, he picks up Vincent, they leave, and it's like, okay, what are we doing here? Yeah, I was very confused at the ending. It was one of those things where it was just a, huh? It just left you wondering. It wasn't, there was no real, uh, answer i guess to the end on top of the match or fight however you want to play this unsanctioned fight in my honest opinion not being so great that just added to the confusion and what the fuck is going on here type thing yeah it was one of those things where i think they built it up and they didn't really deliver whereas i think with the rest of the card they really came through Um, Another thing I thought was really cool is, you know, the women's title situation has been kind of unclear for some time now. Ever since Um, the pandemic, right? Yeah, pretty much. And with, uh, I think, Kelly Klein either left or got her release. Um, Which, that sucks, because she was a great talent and a great person in Ring of Honor. Uh, She was one of my favorite women's wrestlers that they had over there. And I think it was really nice that they brought Maria out to kind of introduce things. Um, Angelina Love speaks for herself. 
Mandy Leone has really built herself up going from places like Northeast Wrestling to Ring of Honor. And then you also have someone like Quinn McKay who, like, they have her do the backstage interviews and all that stuff, but I don't right. think people realize she's also a wrestler because they um, kind of haven't given her that chance. So they announced I, her as being they announced her as being part of the tournament, correct? Yeah, she is part of the tournament. Um, I think the first match is actually her versus Quinn. And if she wins that match, I think she gets a bye or something okay. like that. It was kind of confusing. Yeah. Well, when do we find out more about this? Um, they said the tournament's coming summer 2021, but they didn't really elaborate on it much more. So it's like, hey, we're going to make this cool announcement that we hyped up and then we got to wait. There's probably going to be people that they're trying to get, you know, trying to figure out who they're going to bring into the tournament and what they're exactly going to do and where they're going to hold it. And hopefully, maybe by then, the Ring of Honor will be able to bring in live crowds. Yeah, like, it's one of those things where, like, I love Ring of Honor. I've been going to Ring of Honor shows for forever, but I think they're kind of at a point where it's like, it's very confusing what they want to do, and it almost, to me... Whereas, like, a sim- similar situation to Impact, I feel like Sinclair doesn't really want to pump in as much money. And it's kind of evident at this point. I think you're right to a certain extent. You're pretty much you're almost 100% correct. But I'm going to tell you that, like, they lost a lot of talent to, like, groups like NXT. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they, I, the I majority know. of the... The majority of the biggest names went to, to NXT and yeah. AEW or whatever, but um, Sinclair, like they really struggled for like 2000, like later 2019, all through 2020 with the, uh, uh, especially once the pandemic hit, and then it just like they really struggled hard. When they rebooted, they did a few like best ofs, and then kind of stopped doing weekly TV for a little bit and then when they came back they started just uh, focusing on the pure division and I thought it was fucking amazing I thought they came back and they were doing a really great job at what they were doing and they treated every match like it was a big fight feel you know they had the pre-match interviews and then they went into this like really intense technical match and I was like alright this is cool but after this pay-per-view it seems like they're going a little bit you know you're going to be doing a little bit more than just that, it seems. Yeah, and I, I think the whole thing is, you know, as much as, you know, they have the Ring of Honor world title, bringing back, you mentioned the pure title, um, I think that's a really nice nod to the past, but, you know, at the same time, that opens up, you know, more space for other wrestlers to be like, okay, well, not going for the world title, but, you know, you have the guys that are really good in the ring and really solid and really technical, Like someone like Jonathan Gresham, who like so good. Um, What he has going with the foundation right now is awesome. Um, I think overall they, that faction as a whole, with all their matches on the pay per view, did a really nice job. Right. I'm trying to find out the name of that guy that we were talking about during the Taven match. I know I had it down and I couldn't remember it. Um, Either way, I guess that he did uh, a bunch of CZW stuff like that. He did like a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, where were we? Sorry, we we're talking about uh, the foundation. <laughs> oh, the foundation! One of the greatest groups. I mean, look at those guys. They pretty much just about dominated, with the exception of the main event. They pretty much dominated the pay per view, uh, right? From what I said, like uh, Jay Lethal lost to what's his face, Roosh, but. Um, I have my results in front of me. I am reading that fucking around on my phone. Just for the record. <laughs> yeah, like it was <laughs> to see Gresham. Lost one. Yeah, Tr- Tracy Williams won the title. And then Gresham, he worked a really good match as well. Uh, where is it? It's right here. Against Dak Draper, who I think is really awesome. I think he's really great. I thought that was an awesome match. That was a lot of fun. I completely agree with you. And I think Gresham is one of those guys who's like finally starting to get noticed yeah you know those people who's grinded and grinded and you know ring of honor 
if you look back like at the legacy, especially like with the pure title and people like Nigel McGuinness, who in my opinion is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Absolutely. That guy's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, it's a nice nod to the past, but at the same time for the guy that they're not ready to put the world title on yet, it's like, Hey, here's this. And, and you know, it's a really cool that they brought that belt back. And it's going to be really interesting to see what they do going forward. And especially with the foundation, they are just, especially after the pay-per-view, they're dominating right now. They are ridiculously good. Um, I'll... Go ahead. Sorry. The one thing that I think that might affect uh, uh, Gresham is his size. He's like really tiny, like really, really short. However, he's like one of the top wrestlers of the era, like this era. But he's like, I, I mean, if he, I guess if he stays in the Ring of Honor, he'll do fine. But I'd be afraid to see him go somewhere else because of his size. I yeah. agree. You know, he has, he has like, a, he has a similar to a Daniel Bryan or a Rey Mysterio situation where it's like, this yeah. dude is so solid in the ring, but like. You know, if you go to somewhere like WWE, it's like, oh, it's the land of the Giants. But, you know, even someone like Jericho is not like right. the tall- Benoit was not the tallest guy. And like some of these guys can work and work and work. And, you know, like you said, if he stays in the ring of honor, I think it'll be great for him. I think if he goes somewhere else and is put in the right situation, he'll absolutely flourish. Right. It's things where just... Right time, right place, right situation as far as Gresham goes. All right. See where else here. Let's see what else. Um, that was, oh yeah, Ty, uh, Rhett Titus and Tracy Williams gathered the tag team. Uh, great. I can't even talk tonight. Excuse me. Gathered the world tag team titles. This match was another one. There was a couple missed spots I, I noticed with Rhett Titus, but um, I thought this was a really good match as well. I'm not sure. It was a match, and you know, Rhett Titus is another guy who has been there for a while. He's been yep. doing thing, and it's nice to see him finally get payoff for his work. He's a pretty right. solid. And you know, that's the nice thing about the foundation is you have all these people, but every single person in the group is just killer in the ring. They're all phenomenal, phenomenal athletes. Uh, I really like. I do like Tracy Williams. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> I thought he was one of my favorites, and I, 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 you know, I do, I love professional wrestling, and everybody knows I'm a traditionalist until I came across an intergender match that he did. And I'm not a fan of intergender wrestling. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, it's it just irritates the, the hell out of me. I don't like watching a guy beat up on a woman. So that that just uh, irritates me. And then I came across this match, and it kind of like disappointed me a, a tiny bit. But it seems to be all the trend these days. How do you feel about that? With intergender matches, I personally like them, especially when it's the right situation. Like, for example, you take like Tessa Blanchard and Sammy Callahan. You know, that's the right thing. Or you take Chris Dickinson. And I think it was I think it was Chris Di- uh, Chris Dickinson and Kimberly and beyond. I believe so. Yeah, I think I saw that match. Where yeah. she took uh, she took a pretty nasty bump and it like went viral. Like it's one of those things where uh, if it's the right situation, it's really cool. But if the people don't have chemistry, it doesn't work. I don't know. I just think it's it. Uh, it... For lack of a better term, it looks like a mud show, outlaw mud show type setting. Those matches, I know I'm a I'm a cornet guy, so um, it's just I just sometimes I just see it and it just comes across as like trashy to me. It's just I I don't care for it. I know it's like all the rage for like the last couple of years. So, but that you know that's just my opinion. I'm not going to hate people for liking it. Either way, back to the match. It was a really good match. I thought this was a phenomenal tag team match. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was any moments to take away from it, but uh, 
nothing really too too much that I can think of offhand. I mean, it was a couple of days ago, so I can't remember entirely. Yeah, and then we had the uh, we had the world title match. <sighs> I have a trouble with this match. I really do. I love Jay Lethal. I think he's awesome. I just think some of the moves that Roosh goes for, um, they're just a little bit over the top, it seems like. And, you know, I'd probably, I'd be able to get the hell out of the way if he was giving me a warning that he was just, you know, going to be running at me. And you get what I'm saying as he sets the guy up in the corner. It's just, I don't know. I find him kind of annoying. It's not, I used to really like him a lot. And it's just like, I guess I'm kind of, it's the same thing over and over. But uh, Jay Lethal, I've been watching him. Like, he used to work up here a lot. If you remember back in the earlier 2000s when he was just coming up. and I remember. He's and, a phenomenal know, athlete, dude. My favorite thing with Jay Lethal, like, and I know, but, you know, he was one of those people where, like, they gave him black machismo, which yes. I absolutely loved that gimmick. Um, yes. I love paparazzi productions. You I know. think that- he was they, able to make the best with anything that he, he was given. And he, you know, the thing that when he was going at it with Flair, that was, that was great. You know, the feud that he had with Flair and TNA. That promo, like to this day, the woo off, like you yes. still, and it's great. But at the same time, you just sit there and you laugh your ass off. Like I watched exactly. it. I was rolling laughing, but you know, He's one of those guys who I feel has kind of gotten his due, but at the same time not. Like, he's mm-hmm. held the world title and stuff, but it almost seems like, and I don't know what it is, it almost seems like he's being held back to an extent. Right. I think it's earlier in the night we were just talking about how, like, the... uh foundation dominated pretty much but uh not so much in this match uh we saw the return of homicide which i kind of popped for and chris dickinson popping up speaking of which so i kind of popped for those for 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 those uh guys popping up in uh in this uh for the show because i mean homicide is just a legend you know he's been uh, been around forever i mean that thing homicide's done like you look at like, you, you go back to, like, when Ring of Honor first started, and, like, you look at how he blew up, and then, you know, they put him with Hernandez and LAX, and it was one of yes. those, okay, he's tag team guy now, which LAX was great. They were ahead of their time. Yes. Like, one of the best tag teams. I actually, I see them in a match. I actually saw them on a house show, I think, 2008. I think it was LAX versus Team 3D. And they absolutely tore the house down. And, you know, you talk about ROH 9th anniversary, and I popped for Homicide, too, because I love Homicide. So was it was this, really Was cool. this house show when, uh, when, when TNA came to Wallingford? This was, was that that? Yeah, I didn't go to that, I remember, but uh, my buddy did. I was supposed to go with him. Um, one of the things that the first time I've, uh, I saw Homicide, so I didn't really know much about him. Was Ring of Honor was still relatively new. They were probably like two years in, and I saw him. If you remember when Ring of Honor did a couple shows in Fairfield, Connecticut, at like uh, was it Sacred Heart University? Maybe I think it might have been uh, there. And he and Steve Carino had this crazy, wild brawl, bloody brawl throughout the arena. And I just remember them. I remember at that time period, Steve Carino was doing this gimmick where the announcer had to announce every single title he ever held. And I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And they were brawling in front of me. And they had had this plastic fork uh, they were going after Carino with. This kid picked it up like he had picked up a piece of gold. And his face was filled with excitement. This bloody plastic fork. It was just, I don't know. That was my first impression of Ring of Honor, period. So that was a lot of fun, but very confusing at the same time because <laughs> there was a lot of hype going around the uh, the company because they're this brand new, exciting company. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, like, they've lost a lot of people, but they've still managed to survive. And, you know, going back to the match, like, Homicide was a nice surprise. And then you have someone like Chris Dickinson, 
who again, another guy that's been grinding and grinding and grind and he's a young guy. Right. He's been grinding and grinding, and, you know, he's been showing up on New Japan Strong. He has a lot of buzz behind him, like, to the point he was on Bloodsport and faced John I saw that. Yep, I did see that. He's a a regular at Beyond, uh, right? He's a Northeast guy, so. He's a Northeast guy, yeah. He was a regular at Beyond for forever, and it's, it's really cool to see someone like him just branch out and you know i don't think he's signed anywhere so he's just kind of doing his thing and freelancing and it's really cool you know you see someone like him went from like beyond and got over and just became so popular to the point where it's like you can't deny the guy anymore and like right. he, one of those guys who not only is he really good in the ring he is just nasty he's gritty He's very hard hitting. He's one of those guys that deserves to be a, a, working for a major company and working on television. You know what I mean? Like the guy's been busting his ass for God a long time. He's been around quite a bit, and he's still young, like you said. Yeah, and he's he's one of those guys where I think you know it's great to see him. Like I said, on like New Japan Strong, and now on Ring of Honor. And it's one of those things where, like, given the right situation, strap the rockets to the dude, and he's ready to go. That's, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. So, that's pretty much the show. I mean, the pay-per-view, not the show, our show. But, um, did you happen to catch the Paradise Alley show last night? I did not catch the Paradise Alley show yet. Man, I gotta tell you, it is up on their Facebook page, and I've uploaded a bunch of matches to my YouTube channel. That I recorded on my phone, but I have to tell you, man, this was a fucking awesome show. It really was. Uh, you can definitely tell that the crowd was uh, excited to finally be out of their houses, to finally be at a live event. Uh, it was literally just packed, and the crowd was like wild and hot. And the main event was really awesome. Flash and Chris Battle, it was a really good match. So that was really fun. A lot of fun. They, Paradise Alley, now, like, I remember when they first started till now, and, you know, I'm sure people listening to this, you all know that Paradise Alley trainers are Paul Roma and Mario Mancini. They've both done incredible things in the wrestling business. You look at everything Paul's done, and then you look at everything Mario's done, too, and they both love the business Mm -hmm. so much. And all of their students are just, they have such a good thing going. And you got people like Kylon and Flash, especially, that like. Those guys got a good future in the business, those two right there that you mentioned. Oh, those two are stars, no doubt. Absolutely. I've said that about Kylon King uh, quite a few times. I think that he's got a really bright, bright future in professional wrestling. Oh, absolutely. And then you also have, like, the Haven, which I think they're, they're also good. Yeah. Uh, Waves and Curls are awesome as well. Yeah. You they're know, good. I like them. They're very, uh, they're fun to watch. They're gimmick, but. Yeah. They get that crowd reaction. They which do. Is, and that's, that's and the that, point. Yes. You either have it or you don't. Right. The, the crowd is always behind them. They're, and, you know, they're they're funny and they're good. They're good to watch, and it's uh, they just get that crowd really behind them. And that's really the point when you go to a show is to get that to get that crowd behind you. So, but overall, dude, I think they got a really good product there. They redid the inside. Now, last time I was there, they redid the inside. This is back in October, but then I guess they finished it off the inside, and it's I really love the new setup. Uh, it's really cool. You just yeah. walk in and the chairs aren't right there. They actually set it up al- along the wall and then the, they built like a small room to where all the guys come out now. So it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. It, was, it was it was a lot of fun. I, and I was happy to be at the show. Like seriously, I just dying inside. <laughs> They're stuck inside for a year. Nothing like that live show and that live entertainment. And you know, that's the thing people don't realize is like, those performers, they feed off of it. 
Yes. And you can definitely tell. I've watched their empty arena stuff. And, you know, while some of the stuff was good, it's just the crowd reaction gets them working harder and they want to put on those matches, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So what else you got? Where'd you go? Also, I'm still here. I'm just uh, yeah. reading this card. So, we have AEW Dynamite this week. Yes, refresh my memory on that one because it's been, what, five days? So, Dynamite kicked off with a really good match. Uh, we had Kenny Omega versus Matt Seidel. Which this is a really good match. Yeah. Is, is out of as Evan Bourne for those listening who don't know. Yep. But he, uh, Matt Seidel, one of those guys who has done so much in the business, especially after, you know, from going from Ring of Honor to everything he done on the indies to WWE to going back over to New Japan. It was really cool to see him come back over to the States go to Ring of Honor, and then go to AEW. And I think, you know, when you have someone like Kenny Omega, you have to have someone who can always go with him. And they both have really good chemistry. And Seidel's on a hot streak right now. He was 7-1 and before the match. He's now obviously 7-2. and But... You know, they have a really good thing going with both of those two. And I'm hoping down the line we get some more matches between both of them. Um, Up next, we had the Hangman Adam Page versus Cesar Bonani, which he came over. He was in NXT. Whatever happened didn't work out there. Um, He's a good big man. Yeah. And... Him and Hangman had a really good match. And the thing I like about Hangman is he's just not only does he have a great thing going for him. um, He's just so good in the ring. And especially his uh, buckshot lariat is awesome finisher. Um, It was a really good match. Um, I think Hangman is at the point where they are positioning him to take the AEW world title off Kenny. Um, I see that probably happening, probably all out. I don't see Kenny losing so soon, but it's very possible we could see him lose at double or nothing if that's what they decide to go to. I thought that they were going to put the title on him a lot earlier than that. Uh, Especially, you know, I thought that when I... Okay, what was the pay-per-view that he and Jericho wrestled? That was the first one. So that was all out. That was yeah. the initial world title match. I thought that for some reason that Jericho was going to actually lay down for him and they were just going to make Paige, like, in there. Give him the rub. And if I think that if that happened, it would have made Paige, like, fire up. Like, as far as, like, his star status because Jericho was a star, but obviously they went with the opposite direction. Putting the belt on Jericho because he was the established star, and they must have felt that they needed to put the belt on an established star because of, you know, to get the attention towards them as a company. But I really thought that they were going to do, like, you know, I felt that if they put that belt on him, it's going to push him to, like, superstardom as far as that, if if, uh, Jericho put him over. Oh, and absolutely. And if you think about it, too, it's one of those things where, you know, you sit and you're like, oh, what's this AEW? Oh, they have Chris Jericho. Oh, they have this person. They have that person. You just hear the name Chris Jericho. I mean, if you cross somebody on the street, you're like, oh, you know who Chris Jericho is? There's a good chance that person's going to know who it is. So I understand why they did what they did. Absolutely. Look and, at their roster. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'll wait to, I'll wait to them. And it's one of those things where now that they put the belt on someone established, you know, they built this, even the Kenny, the Kenny Jericho feud, like they had the perfect blow off match. 
and then having the debut of Moxley after that match at Double or Nothing 2019, it was like, you kind of <laughs> knew Moxley was probably going to be the guy to win the belt eventually. Yeah, yeah. Because that's another thing where it's like, oh, like, oh, you know who Dean Ambrose is, which I know he personally hates being called Dean. I actually met him at Comic-Con, funny story. And he's like, honestly, he's like, I'm just happy I get to use my real name now. Well, he had that name for years prior to going into uh, WWF or WWE, excuse me. So that's the thing with WWE is they make just about there's like one percent of the of the uh, talent that gets to use the names they had prior or their own name or whatever. And a lot of times they come up with just these ridiculous names. You, I'm sure you're more than well aware. Yeah, if you uh, if you watch the uh, if you watch like the there's a new Steve Austin documentary coming out, and there was an interview with him actually a few weeks ago. One of the names they were like going to give him was like uh, the Iceman or like Fang McFrost or something like that. Like, yeah, they came up with something really ridiculous, and then uh, Otto von Ruthless. <laughs> I've heard something similar to that too, and I just remember that it was like his wife, accident, like he accidentally came up with the name drinking his tea. You know, like uh, his wife told him better drink it because it get before it gets stone cold. Then he just like kind of sat there, it was like stone cold Steve Austin. Like I thought, I just think it's pretty like pretty funny, and he got to use that name Steve Austin. You know, he had that well before he was in WWF. Yep. yep. It's I'm one. Where like with AEW's roster, like you know, you talk about the established stars, but they've done a really good job of where now you don't have to put the belt on someone like a Chris Jericho. You right. can put Kenny or a Hangman Page or you know whoever they decide to put the belt on at this point. Like even somebody like Lance Archer, I think could be a champion down the line. I think so. The thing with like Kenny Omega, like. He... It was really popular everywhere else, except for the United States. Like, but you know that the fan base, AEW fan base, all knew who he was. He was like immensely popular in Japan. It's just like putting the title on him in the United States. I, I still thought it was like kind of a big risk in a way. But it's you know, even though he'd been on television in the United States for a year, like your casual fan doesn't necessarily know who he is still, uh, which I find interesting. I don't think a lot of casual fans really watch AEW, though. I've yeah. always considered there's wrestling fans and WWE fans. Yeah, and, you know, the WWE fans probably don't watch AEW. Like, I know, like, I am a WWE fan. I'm not a fan of the current product, but I think AEW is more for your smart fans and people that don't feel like their intelligence is being insulted. Yeah. Because WWE has a habit right now of where it's, like, the early 90s, before about right before they got their ass kicked for two years by wcw they live in their own world you know it's like they and some of the fans just eat it up and they don't care or they just don't know anybody any better they sit there and take it and they just be like they'll just be like yeah this is kind of stupid but they still tune in tune in every monday and friday yeah. so absolutely and, I mean, and, you know, that's the thing about AEW is, you know, it's another thing where, like, everyone's like, oh, like, it's, you know, past WWE talent. But you think about it, everybody starts somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere, like you said. And not for nothing, when I grew up, you know, there was, like, three to four major companies, okay? There was, like, the NWA, the AWA. There was world class. Guys would go from territory to territory. So that's, it's, to me, it's, like, the same thing. You know what I mean? It's just a guy, if they get tired of working one area or they're sick of, uh, or they're not getting over in a certain company anymore, so then they just move to the next company. You know, it's, I don't see anything wrong with it, but a lot of people are just complaining. And if you look at the roster, it's like, it might be a lot of ex-WWE guys or WWF, whatever, but the thing with that is, it's look what they were doing with that talent to make them jump from WWF to another one and they're being treated better creatively, creatively, rather, excuse me, in that uh, company, except for Mero. Like his yeah. storyline sucked. 
Yeah, it's one of those things where everyone's like, oh, like, you know, it's TNA or WCW 2.0. And it's like, I've heard that. (laughs) Like, I understand, you know, they signed Jericho, they signed Thing, they signed uh, Jake the Snake, they signed Darn Anderson. But here's the thing is, they're all managerial roles. Oh, sorry. Even Sting, like, he did a cinematic match, but it's all managerial, and that's how you use a legend. Like, yeah, yes. you're those people that not. WCW and are like, oh, wait, Sting's back on TNT? Oh, okay, I'll tune in. If you think about it, though, it's kind of like he, the height of his career, he was on TNT. Yep. You know what I mean? So him returning to a turn, the Turner Network or you know, is a big thing uh, for the wrestling fan that used to just watch WCW all the time. Yeah, and speaking of Sting, after the Hangman Page match, we had a, a promo from Lance Archer. He was talking to Sting. He was talking about how he looked up to him. And how he told Sting, hey, this is why I interrupted you last week and basically said... You know, it's showtime, which is Sting's signature phrase. And you you think about that, too. And now you have someone like Lance Archer, who in TNA, he was killer. Then he went to WWE and he was one of those people. They just signed to sign. They had no idea what to do with him. He goes over to New Japan, gets over as can be to the point, you know, especially when the pandemic hit. His deal was up. Think about this. You want to stay in Japan or you want to come live in Texas with your family and work in the States. And it was one of where it worked out great for him. And, you know, the whole thing with AEW needing big men, you have people, especially like Hager, who's a really big dude. And you have someone like Archer and Archer is one of those big men that I think they can build a cornerstone around. Right. And like, I'm really looking forward to seeing because it's obvious they're building to a program with either Sting or Darby, which it seems like it's leaning more towards Sting, which I'd be fine with. Right. Um, that's how I'm guessing. Uh, you know, Sting didn't get a proper send off for his retirement, if you think about it. I mean, because he got injured, and even though he got in better shape, he never, uh, and it wouldn't clear him. So it's possible that he might just come and do that one match. I mean, you know. I mean, he was he did an interview the other day and Sting was like, Yeah, Tony and I have been talking about matches on Dynamite, which I think if they do like a couple matches a year on Dynamite, that's fine. But more than that, you don't and he's he's fine. And, you know, he said in an interview, oh, the cinematic match took so much out of me. That's because you're not doing a 30, 40 minute match. You're filming for 12 hours. Right. Because Where, like you said, and, yeah, he said he's conditioned to do, you know, 30 minute match, which with how good of shape he's in, especially at 61. Yeah. I'd stay with him doing a couple matches like uh, Sting versus Archer. Or Sting versus Cody, which is obviously going to happen eventually. Go out there for 15 minutes and entertain the crowd. And I think that Sting could do that for 15 minutes. And it'll please older fans like uh, myself who grew up watching him. You know, because, I mean, at this point, I mean, I don't want to see a lot of, you know, there's not many older guys I want to see. Like, I don't want, Ric Flair is probably the greatest of all time. I don't want to see him get back. Sting, I'd probably want to see at least one more time. You know what I mean? And do a proper send-off type match. Or maybe yeah, if he, he deserves it for all he gave to the business for as long as he did. Because right. you think, look at how loyal he was to WCW and then, like, nothing happened. At, like, yeah, he went to TNA and had some great feuds and then he went to WWE and they basically shit all over him and his legacy. Yeah. It was one of those things where, oh, hey, we're bringing in Sting, but in Vince's mind, oh, hey, this is the final piece of WCW. This is the nail in the coffin. That's exactly what I said when that match happened at WrestleMania. The Seth Rollins and him when Seth went over. And I said, this is just, I said, I got pissed off. 
you know, I said, this is, I said, this is ridiculous. I said, what kind of a debut is this? And I said, this is just Vince jerking himself off. It's the final nail in the coffin because they couldn't have Sting right from WCW. You know, he didn't come in. He went to TNA. Like, yeah. And and just to correct you on that, it was Triple H versus Sting. But yeah, uh, I know. I know who. Oh, you're uh, right. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. The Seth feud came later, but you're right. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. I think um, Triple also has that Vince mindset where it's like, oh, hey, let's do this. Well, if you remember, for about a good two, three years, Hunter um, basically buried everybody. Like, he... He did not, you know, he uh, did not any, uh, yeah, he did not put anybody over for like a good two or three years. Like he just went through for just be everybody for like a good two, three years just to put himself over, you know, just to make himself uh, like a big shot. This is when it, he first got into the, became a, a time too. I'm like, yeah. Like look at WrestleMania 19, like Booker should have won the world title. A hundred percent. But no, Triple H has to go over. And it's one of those things where, you know, that's where AEW does it right is, yes, Sting went over Starks and Cage, but Darby also got the win. So all three people got the rub. Yes. And it's right in that situation, you know, not where I've said it before, you don't need. And I love Goldberg. I am a Goldberg fan. But, oh hey, uh you're going to come in and squash the fiend in five minutes and win the universal title, which by the way, stupid fucking name for a belt, like so awful. I said that right from the beginning that the universal title was just ridiculous. You know, it sounds like an eight year old created the belt, (laughs) you know, it's like, it just, and it's just like, it's an ugly belt on top of it. It's just ridiculous. It's, the, what's the point of one company holding two different belts? I get it. There's a brand split, but but we remember? did the split, you know, in 2002, and you know, you had eventually after they got rid of, you know, well before they got the world title, the right. champion did on both brands. You know, you had someone like Brock, who was facing this person, that person. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the initial when they initially talked about the original brand split back in 2002, you said? Yeah. They said that basically the world champion was going to bounce from show to show. That only lasted a couple of weeks before they created the world title. They yep. just said there was going to be one champion. So um, I would have preferred it being the one champion going back and forth, but... It also got you to uh, see some really great matches for titles. You know what I mean? I mean, look what happened to WrestleMania 20. Uh, you know, the triple threat for the world title. What was the... the who did Eddie wrestle at WrestleMania 20? Before I make another mistake. So, uh, so I watched it. Her angle at WrestleMania 20. Okay. So, I was right. That's what I had in my head. I just didn't want to say it without... So... But those were both really great matches. You know, you got to see two world title matches and just Yeah, and it's one of those things where like having the separate titles, you know, you got to before Edge won the WWE title, you know, you got to see him feud a little bit, but you didn't yeah. see him one and then, you know, when he won money in the bank for the first time and finally won the title, it was like, okay, here and then when they did when they decide to put the uh, WWE title on somebody else. Okay. Edge has money in the bank. Oh, okay. Go cash in on taker. And we saw so many matches, like even like Orton versus Benoit at SummerSlam 04. And then you had Batista and triple H feuding over the world title while you had Cena feuding with somebody else over the WWE championship. And that was like really cool. Cause around that time you had, Cena and JBL feuding, and you had Triple H and Batista feuding, and it was all world titles. And that's the cool thing, whereas now it's like, okay, sure, we got these two world titles, but there's too many belts. Yes. 
Um, you're saying right now you think that there's too many belts. Yeah. Well, you, you think about this. You have. <sighs> yeah. You have SmackDown tags. You have the U.S. title. You have the IC title. You have the women's titles. That you is... have women's tag titles. You have the NXT women's tag titles. You have the NXT tag titles. You have the North American Championship, and you have the NXT Championship. Is the Cruiserweight title still a thing? Cruiserweight title, I think, is still a thing. They haven't really focused on it much because they're doing the whole interim champion thing where they have, I think, Santos. That's Espen right. As feuding uh, with Devlin, who came back, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, now, I remember. I think it's going to be a ladder match. I don't think they officially announced it, but. They kind of hinted at it. Now, my question is this. I saw this online last night. What's going on with 205 Live? Is that uh, going to be on Peacock? I'm not exactly sure. but And that's another thing is the whole Peacock deal is a shit show. Oh, we'll get into that. You last spoke. You know, and that's that's what you think about is you have 205 Live. A program like 205 Live who gives other guys like, you know, like Aria Davari and Brian Kendrick and all these other guys that aren't really like main roster somewhere yeah. else to shine. And it's like, oh, hey, we're taking this away from you. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to because they haven't really mentioned what's going to go on with the whole Peacock thing. I don't think at least. It's been rumored for almost two years that 205 Live was getting canceled. So, But obviously they never materialized. They deny it every time. Yes. But the thing with it is you know, during the pandemic they had some weird episodes until they started filming some empty arena stuff for it. Because they had some like best ofs where like the guys would share their favorite matches and then uh, so I'm guess I'm pretty sure I haven't watched it in a while. But I read somewhere that somebody inquired with Peacock and they said that it's going to be, it will be uploaded, but it'll be like a week or so after the fact that it's shown live. But I'm just like, it's shown live that right might- on the network. So are they going to show it live at 10 o'clock on Friday nights on Peacock? That's my, that's my main question right here, like currently. Yeah, the whole, the whole Peacock move is really confusing. Mm. Oh, it is. Because very, they said, and here's the thing: is I understand them editing out the racist stuff. Well, we'll get into that, but you know, I'm not saying. <laughs> you know, we've just, we've discussed that stuff. Yeah, there is a lot of stuff that they could always put up a disclaimer as well. And I'm not saying that it's right or it's wrong. It's definitely not right. But they're going to be editing out a lot. Of material if that's the case they're going yeah. to be uh, and if you look at say other companies that have uh, questionable material such as that there's always something that says you know this is not going to be suitable for all the audiences and then at that point it's at the viewer's discretion so now I mean you're taking full matches out of major cards like and and stuff like that. So I know there's that, you know, because it all fits in with uh, Peacock's uh, standards and practices and stuff like that. So there was actually a statement put out yes uh, this week that was basically like, "Hey, uh, we have to obey Peacock's standards." Blah blah blah. And it's like, why did you get rid of the network then? Do you think that Vince knew this when he was going into this oh, deal? Absolutely. You don't make, a, you know, I think the deal's for like a quarter of a million per year. You know, you don't make that type of big money deal, especially without knowing everything that comes with it. My other thing is like how much of the territory stuff is going to be taken away too. If they're going to be uploading it now, they do you know how much they have that they just have not digitized yet? They it's just only like, do it because they can. It was like 
five episodes of Smoky Mountain up there. Like their AWA catalog that they own is like tremendous, and they barely have any of it up on the network. They have like only a few events. Uh, they have a pretty good chunk of the world class material that they own up there, but it's it's just really like. It's kind of heartbreaking as a fan, but I mean, I know I could find a lot of it on YouTube, but the quality is not going to be the same. It's not coming from the direct masters. And here's here's the thing that's confusing to me is so Peacock has their terms of service and everything, right? Yes. We all, you and I are both Crispin Wa fans. Absolutely. We all Probably know him. the situation surrounding, you know, the circumstances. Yes. But here's the thing, so you're going to edit Roddy Piper's match out of WrestleMania 6, which... With everything going on in today in the world, I I get that part. I do. I understand it, but it's like, and I understand Benoit's on there for historical purposes, but it's like, hey, we're going to put all these Chris Benoit matches on Peacock, but we're going to edit out this from WrestleMania 6, or we're going to edit out this segment from Survivor Series 2005. And, like, I get it because the segment between McMahon, Booker T, and Cena, I mean, you look at that today and it's like, oh. It's not that long ago if you think about it. It's really not that long, that far back when that happens, See, uh, which I find bizarre. One of the other things is that there's no Monday Night Raw. Do you remember when uh, when, uh, Jerry Lawler and Goldust were feuding? Gary Lawler calls Goldust a flaming fag. Not this is not my personal thought, but he says that live on Monday Night Raw. I was like, are they going to go in there and edit that out too? I it mean, surprised me at this point because with what WWE is saying is all that content isn't going to be moved over till probably August, September. Right. Editing this much out, it's going to take a lot longer, in my opinion. It's going to take a lot longer, from what I gather, because of all this editing. And there's there's going to be a lot of stuff that they're going to edit out. They've got to go through. Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting. I mean, personally, for me, I'm not a fan of Peacock so far. Like, the streaming works great. Works so much better than the network. But I can't really stand the ads. And on top of that... Sorry, somebody's calling my name. Um, but yeah, they. Um, oh shit, what was I going to say? There's one other thing. The streaming. Okay, that's what I want to say. You said the streaming. The streaming worked perfect as compared to WWE Network itself because WWE Network always log me out. Log me out. Uh, if I tried to fast forward or skip matches, it always logged me out, buffered, and then logged me out. Um, if you notice, I always go, or I don't know if you've had this issue, but if you go to an event, press play, the whole menu is still underneath it. I had to actually play with it to get the whole. Yeah, you have to menu. back out and then go back in. Like, who created that? Like, that's ridiculous. It just it got to the point where, uh, like, I love the network because, like you, I love going back and watching all the old stuff from my era. It, all the stuff that I grew up with, I love going back. And there's not a lot of it because the majority of the stuff they have up there is like the uh, there's like the prime time episodes, but the superstars and the challenge they just started putting up the challenge like a month before they decided that the that it was coming off. Yeah, and like another thing is like I like to go back and watch Nitro. I can't go yeah, back and watch I'll do it then. Yeah, the WCW pay per views are up on the Peacock so far, from what I gathered. I just skimmed through it a little bit to see what footage was up there i didn't like go detailed checking uh into there i actually am watching something on the wwe network now um it locked me out it it didn't log me out but it locked like it's showing videos that are locked yes so what i'm guessing that means that it was already go ahead so what they did with that is they told everyone oh you know your account's gonna go to like april 4th or 5th all right Obviously, you can see that's not the case with the lock. So what they did was they basically canceled everybody's accounts the day Peacock's launched, which I think is just like, oh, hey, well, and, and, you know, that's the thing that bothers me with WWE now is it's like, 
I was a loyal fan for, you know, the past like 20 years and it's like, oh, hey, yeah, we did this cool thing with all this content, but uh, hey, fuck you. Yeah. How long was the network around? About six or seven years, maybe? Oh, maybe eight years. Yeah, about eight years. Eight, almost eight. Yeah. We're, February would be eight years because it launched yeah. shortly before WrestleMania 30, which I yeah. was like. Oh, this is amazing. I don't have to pay for pay-per-views. I just have to pay $10 right. a month. And here's the thing. You buy two pay-per-views, that's a yearly Peacock or Network subscription. So, I mean, like, it's great for those people, but, like... I get it for free because I get the... Uh, if you have Xfinity, and yeah. I know there's another company, a uh, cable company. I don't remember which one, but it's included in the package, the $5 tier. So you basically, you know, you could either get peacock for free or half the price depending on what you're doing so depending on your cable subscriber i um so far from what i experienced the streaming is really good except the fact that you can't pause fast forward or rewind uh i wish i could press pause like especially seeing that i'm doing this whole podcast thing and if i want to pause it you know uh to leave the room to say go to the bathroom, you know, I can't. If I, I have to get up, I'm just going to miss out on whatever the hell is happening. Yeah. You know? and so I try to go up, uh, try to get up during like maybe a mismatch or something, if that's yeah. possible. Especially during the live content, you can't do that. And that's the thing that right. sucks. But a fast forward when you're watching like the, the archived content and then you have an ad. Oh, I want to skip some more. Another ad. That's, like, yes. I, you can yep. pay for more dollars for the ad for you but it's like do do i really want to just and it's not it's not that like they don't have a lot of content on they don't it's not worth it right now unless you're going to be a regular peacock watcher i mean with the exception of they've done some retro shows from like the era that i grew up like saved by the bell or punky brewster it's like sure i'll probably watch those to check them out because there's shows from when I was a kid that they made modern ver- versions of. Am I going to freaking get totally invested in them? No, not at all. But, you know, it's like, I don't know what else on Peacock I'd really get totally invested in. I mean, it's an NBC network. I don't watch a lot of regular television outside of wrestling or, and the stuff I watch with my wife as it is. You know, baseball, sure, but that's about it. Yeah, it's the same thing for me, you know, like. I again like I loved the network because I like going back and watching Raws that I went to in like 2006 and 2000 yes. and it's like I can't go back and watch that like one of the shows I was missing for years was the Raw 15th anniversary show that I went to at Harbor Yard in 2007 which that was that was a great show like top to bottom awesome show uh just off the top of my head the opener was and you think about matches it was mm-hmm. Jeff Hardy versus Carlito in a ladder match. The dark match, I remember, and you're going to like this one, the dark match was David Hart Smith versus Steve Carino. Steve Carino? Really? Yeah, Steve Carino I, wrestled the dark match for WWE. I, I, know never, he I never knew that he actually uh, tried out for them. Um I was always, always under the assumption this is what uh, that his face was too um, scarred up from blading. You know, that's what I that's what I heard because they like to have a lot of pretty boys on uh, on their TV show. Basically, they don't. You know, everybody's got to have a certain look because they're a television program. You get what I'm saying? So, I completely get that. But you know, it's one of those things where, like that show, like I can't go back and watch it now. And another thing I remember about that show, speaking of uh, supposed Hall and Fame inductee Rob Van Dam, Rob Van Dam was a surprise and beat Sir Santino Morella in like 30. I heard about that show. Yeah, I um, I heard that match rather because I think my buddy went to that. I was invited, but that was when I blew off. So <laughs> it was, you know. But yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it's like I... I WWE has been profitable enough, especially during COVID. So it's like it's one of their best years they've had during the past year with uh, COVID. It's like why do this deal? So it's one of those things where I just kind of question it. Yeah, it's it's all greed. 
it's a total mind fuck. Like, hey, let's make some money, but you know, fuck our fans. But yes. you know, it's it's the same thing. Like, I I don't buy t shirts from them anymore because they're garbage quality. Like, the shirt I'm wearing now, it's like three years old. It's like a thick t shirt, yeah. and. You Know that not that there's anything wrong with like the soft style t-shirts but like i don't want like a hot topic t-shirt i hear you um i don't buy a lot from them but i think uh i just did buy i just placed two orders from them in the last like month uh which is probably the first time in over a year that i've that i've ordered from them and a lot of the times is I'll go to their clearance section because they always put some really good shit in their clearance section as far as shirts. So you can score some really good shirts for like, you know, ten, eleven dollars, something like that. Like I buy the retro shirts, and it's it's one of those things where it's like I notice they don't last, and it's it's one of those things where I think they've grown to a point where they're such a corporation that it's like, and I I get it, like it that's exactly a corporation, but it's like. That's oh, exactly it. They lost the train of they lost their original plan, their train of thought. Because they're just, if you look at them, they're just a merchandise horse at this point. They make merchandise now. If you were, if you grew up in the time period, like I know, I'm a little bit older than you, but it was pretty similar at the time, that that time period as well that you were coming up. They didn't make merchandise for every single guy in the roster. No, it was you had to. Be, it was the baby. It was the baby faces and the top guys, pretty much. Like, I remember Probably. the Raw, and, like, they didn't have, you know, merchandise for all these people. Like, they had Rey Mysterio shirts, uh, Batista yeah. shirts, Edge shirts, John Cena shirts, Triple H shirts, Stone Cold shirts, uh, like the replica masks, some Undertaker shirts. Like yeah. that. And now didn't... it's, and now it's, they make merchandise for, they make shirts for at least Every single person on the roster, like some of it's and, garbage. like some, some of it's, of it's garbage. absolute garbage. Because if you look at their clearance section, they have a lot of just like little knickknacks, and they sell that stuff at live events too. They sell a lot of that garbage knickknack shit that you can buy in WWE shop for like four or five dollars on clearance, like hand sanitizer with the WWE logo on it, and all that kind of garbage. Like there's this, like I love Matt Riddle, for example. Like I love sorry Matt Riddle. But they have a T-shirt. Now, as you probably know, Matt Riddle calls his United States title Travis. Uh, <laughs> so clever. Already fucking questionable. Right. Then you have a shirt here. I'm actually looking at it now. It is. It says Travis and I flying high. And it is a eagle with Matt Riddle's hair and a patriotic bandana on a branch surrounded by a circle. <laughs> like, honestly, like, who the fuck comes up with this shit? I mean, did you see there's a lot of garbage shirts? Oh, yeah. There. Whoever's designing them the last, like, three, four, five years... There's some really questionable I've shirts. I've done some have. really cool designs for them. Like, I have a buddy who um, designed a shirt that's on shop for, like, uh, Donovan Dijak or Dominic Dijakovic. Get it right. It's Dijakovic these days. So, yeah. um, No, that's a really nice shirt because I've had it in my cart, like, 50 times, and then I just, like, clear it out. But I really, you know, I always want to buy that shirt. Or it's, like, but T-Bone. Um, <laughs> they have they're just like a merchandise whore at this point they make anything and everything I mean you can go to places like Buy Below and the dollar store and buy stuff at this point like WWE and so they you, don't care they don't care at all you go to Walmart I was actually at Walmart earlier tonight yeah. do you know they have WWE hand sanitizing wipes Yes, my son bought me some with uh, <laughs> a, a and sanitizing wipes with Becky Lynch, The Rock, Bailey, John Cena, and I think Kofi Kingston's face on them. Like, my son bought me some for my birthday. He bought me a, a an AJ Styles one, a cartoon of AJ Styles because he knew I liked AJ Styles. So I just thought that was uh, you could, like I said, that's like 
simple things like that, like everyday needs. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what it's like if you've watched Spaceballs and where they just made all those like gimmicks and Spaceballs, like Spaceballs, the toilet paper and all that other shit. It's exactly like that. It's like they just make everything. They just make household items and all that other garbage. It's pretty comical to begin with. It's it's really confusing, but it's just like, why would anybody buy some of this stuff? Every year, all the Christmas ornaments are on clearance like a week later. Because they're they just... Yeah. It's just ridiculous. They they make every... They just make ridiculous stuff, and it's just... Whereas, like, you... You have people like AEW, you, you and I go on pro wrestling and, like... It's a great company. The shirts are awesome. Like, yes. the, the comfiness of the shirts in general, but, like, even the designs. Like, yes. that, I'm selective of what I buy because you go in there and it's like, oh, man, I want everything. And, you know, AEW technically is a corporation, but mm-hmm. also because someone like Tony Khan is such a humble human being along with most of that roster, they don't want it be like oh hey we're a corporation now like they still know they care about their fans like they have a sale every week just about uh, especially during dynamite dynamite flash sale yeah and you know people have been struggling with getting the AEW figures in stores and i'm sure you've seen they've put them on pro wrestling oh yeah they, they had um the series three or something right up or yeah, whatever series two yeah, too I got a, a notification on my phone during Dynamite. And they had them up there for like a couple of days and they were just about sold out uh, real quick. But between Pro Wrestling Tees, and I, don't, I know they run Shop AEW as well, but they have, they care about their customers. I know like 98% of that stuff is print on demand with the, they probably, with the exception of like, say, the big names, I'd assume, or like the bigger titles. Like I'm sure they don't print everyone. Like Bullet Club shirt on demand, they probably have you know however many of those already made up. But it's like if there's like some random indie wrestler from my hometown, Kylan King, or Flash Waller, I go on Pro Wrestling Tees and there's their shirt. You know what I mean? So it's and it's cool. That's the cool thing about a company like that. You know what I mean? It's like they make it easy for indie wrestlers out there to. To get merchandise made. Absolutely. They're not that greedy either. I mean, they're pretty generous with the pricing. Uh, for the most part, unless, you know. And they were struck out, de- struck deals with, like, a lot of different companies. Like, you know, however many uh, wrestling companies throughout the entire world get their shirts made from them uh, yeah. in, here in the United States because of that. You Ring of Honor Impact, they all have stores on pro wrestling tees. Yeah, MLW, uh, New Japan does too. Uh, now Noah and All Japan, all these, uh, you name it. It's with the exception of WWF, WWE, and for a while, you were able to find certain WWE guys up there. Not the legends, but guys that were current roster guys. Like I know for a while, Keith Lee. And Drew Gulak and Tommaso Ciampa and even Killer Cross, they all had merchandise stuff stores up there up until recently because I, I used to go up there and there was like a, there was like a couple designs about each of those guys I was going to buy. And then when I went back, they were gone in the last month. Yeah, it's Except, one of the things for another thing about WWE not caring. Oh, you guys can't make any third party money. And that's the other thing that irritates me. Pro wrestling and these stores are gone now. You know, but you to have someone like who's not an active performer who's signed to a Legends deal. Oh, hey, we have your merch on shop. Oh, also, we're going to have your merch here. He creates his own merch. Guys like him, Bret Hart, uh, you know, I could think of oh, the British Bulldogs. You know, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. They all make merchandise. Uh, well, I mean, the British Bulldogs are dead, but, you know, their families are able to make that merch and Brett and you know it's it's really cool that they can do that but at the same time you go to WWE shop and they have a lot of their their, their versions of their shirts too it's like you said they're legends deals so what is in the legends contract they just make special appearances every now and again and they're able to make legend uh like action yeah. 
reissues of t-shirts from the 80s and 90s or whatever. I mean, there's like, cool ideas behind them. But... Speaking of reissues, like they reissue a lot of like the shirts, like the Austin shirts from like 2004 and the early yes. 90s and 2006. And for a while, while Brock's merchandise was still on there, they did reissues of even some of his shirts from 2004 and 2002. My other question is this: With all the censorship censorship going on, is WWE still uh, selling the Stone Cold Fuck Fear T-shirt? No, it's a good one to think about. <laughs> that was a great one, but sadly, it no. was. I I came across it the other day. I think, uh, uh, you know, on YouTube or something like that. He was wearing like the baseball hat because you know they had the hats and the uh, the thing. So, anyways, what else you got? Do you have anything else, or do you want to wrap it up for now? Um, I guess we can talk about the rest of Dynamite. Oh, crap. We still got to finish that. That's right. There's a lot of... Really, actually, we got we only got about halfway through Dynamite, right? Yep. So, after the segment between Lance Archer and Sting, um, after the absolutely incredible Lights Out match between... Bit- Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa. Britt Baker came out and she cut a promo and she didn't, she got a very heel reception. Yeah. Um, she actually went as far as to call the fans delusional and she cut an absolutely gazing promo. She also took a friendly shot at Mick Foley where she said, and I quote, Mick Foley, thanks for the thumbs up. It took you 20 years to become the hardcore legend, and I did it in one night. And that night when I had 87 thumbtacks in my back and blood flowing down my face, I never saw more clearly. And then she also took a friendly shot at the legends and goes, Tony Khan, you have all these legends, but I'm standing right here, and I put the company on the map, and AEW comes second behind DMD. And, you know, for her to go out on live television in front of a crowd like that and cut a promo like that, it's like, wow, dude. She's just, she's one of those people where, like, you know, like, I've been a her like, since the beginning. It's been great to see her thrive and the whole women's division thrive as a whole. Yeah. I think that she, that was probably one of the best promos that I've seen her cut because, uh, you know, she really struggled in the beginning. I think me and you talked about that last week. And, you know, she'd come out and, She'd have issues, you know, she'd come out talking with Tony Schiavone, cutting heel promos, but there were not anything to be writing home about. But this one really delivered. And I think that match really helped, too, that match with Thunder Rosa. I got to tell you, I said it last week when we talked about it. It's definitely going to be up there with, like, one of the best matches of the year. Oh, absolutely. And we're only in March, so. And, you know, people shit all over the women's division. And, you know, the women, like they've said, you know, they're growing, and it's one of those things where they've really been able to show, like, hey, you want to talk shit? Here you go. Shove this. And, and I, I just think it's it's showing what they could do in AEW. So now if every woman, woman – I'm sorry. If the entire women's division can deliver like that or if they uh, – if in that company or if they bring in enough talent equivalent to that rather than – uh you know what I'm saying? It's like they've really struggled because it's like a lot of these wrestlers that are in there are wrestlers that Kenny Omega brought over from Japan, and some of them just aren't. You know, maybe they're just not getting over enough because of the international barrier or whatever. A lot of people not necessarily knowing who they are. But like you said earlier, the AEW fans are a bit smarter than your average wrestling fans. They kind of what were these guys into prior to AEW? A lot of them were into like New Japan and such. Absolutely, and you know that's the good things is is these fans are smart and like the good thing with AEW is if something's not working and they tell can tell the fans don't like it, it's like okay, hey, we're not going to do this. Like they'll, they'll, example, they'll quit. Yeah, the Nightmare Collective that was kiboshed like that. Yeah. Um, you know we we touched last week. You know, going further into the show, we touched last week on the signing of Christian Cage. <sighs> 
what he's going to do. So they had a backstage segment, and he was sitting and talking with uh, the Varsity Blondes and Dante from Top Flight. Um, and Dasha, you know, basically asked what he was doing, and he's like, you know, hey, I'm giving these guys some advice because I know a thing about tag team wrestling. And, you know, kind of nodded to his tag team past. And I'm sure you've seen BTE and you've also watched Dynamite. So you kind of know what's going on with Kazarian. And a little bit, yeah. The whole cranky Frankie, as they call it. <laughs> so Kaz interrupted Christian and uh, goes, so, you know, blah, 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 you're here. And I see your shirt says outwork everyone. And, you know, I've been doing that because I'm an AEW original. and I've been doing it since day one. And he asked Christian when the work starts. Um, And so Christian said the work starts next week, mentions how he doesn't have an opponent. And basically challenges Kaz. Kaz accepts. So next week it's going to be Christian. Well, this week. Based on this week, yep. It's going to be this week, Cat versus Christian on Dynamite. And uh, then Kazarian, which I think might have kind of been a shot at WWE, which was actually really funny. Oh, hey, are, are you doing anything on Mondays? Oh, wait, that's right. You're not doing anything on Monday. You should come to the elevation. You could look at the finger. I, t- I thought that was great. I did, the, I did take that as a shot for uh, against WWE because, I, you know, I mean... I mean, it's or maybe it was just plainly obvious, so that it was uh, that maybe it couldn't have been. But I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it was. What else, as far as the AEW? Because there was just a few yeah. more segments. A few more segments. But uh, going back to Kraz and Christian for a sec, you know, Christian's been gone from the ring seven years, but. You go back and like you go back to like 2007, and you look at some of the matches that Christian and Kaz had, especially Kaz still being as good as he is. Uh-huh. Perfect person for Christian to have his first match with, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I think it's gonna be a really good match. I think it's gonna open a lot of eyes, and for everyone that's like, "Oh, why'd you sign Christian? He's gonna shut people up." Um, so- I really hope so. I really hope he shuts people up i never did not not like him you know what i mean um i always thought he was a great worker i enjoyed him in his his stay in wwe enjoyed him in tna and i enjoyed him more than i liked edge um but you know i wasn't overly excited of him coming to aew i wasn't like a lot of people are and then there's obviously a lot of doubters unfortunately i'm going to admit i'm kind of slightly doubting him even though i'm like, and then the only reason I'm doubting is because of his age. That's it. And can he still go out there and do it? Uh, I think he's been retired things. for seven years. I think it's one of those things where, like he mentioned, if he couldn't go like he wanted to go, he wouldn't be doing this. So, you know, as someone who kind of saw what he did when he jumped from WWE to TNA. I really believe that given time and how much training and conditioning he's been putting in, I think it's going to be really cool to see what he can do. And, you know, time will tell, but I'm looking forward to it. And so after that promo, we had um, the trios debut of the pinnacle. So it was FTR and Sean Spears versus the varsity blondes and Dante Martin. Um, really solid tag match. Um, I think overall, uh, Pillman Jr. has really started to come into his own. I wasn't big on him at first because yeah. he was very green. Um, but it's one of those things where with the more experience, he gets better and better. Um, mm-hmm. Then you got someone like Griff Garrison who basically got himself over and became a running joke on BTE. Where it's like, who the fuck is Griff Garrison? Which is great. Right. And then I think Darius is actually injured right now. So that's why they had Dante. Which is fine. Um, I think Top Flight's a really cool tag team. They created buzz for themselves. And the good thing about people like Top Flight, they're both like 20 years old. They got a lot of ring time on them in the future. And I think given the right opportunity, 
especially same thing with the varsity blondes, given the right opportunity, both teams are definitely going to shine. It's just one of those things where um, tag team wrestling gets taken very seriously. So it's one of those things where everyone's going to have their time. I'd really like for um, tag team wrestling to be taken really seriously because, like, uh, AEW, it's not – there's so much potential there. It really is. There's just uh, just so much that could really happen, and it's just not happening right now for me because it's just – it seems to be bouncing all over the place. It's not necessarily uh, delivering. I mean, you know, you had FDR. uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Kenny and and Paige and I don't really know what else is going on over there currently. I think it's one of those things they kind of uh, they kind of switch their focus on. Hey, our focus is going to be this for a little bit, or hey, our focus is going to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because the one thing I like about their show is you're not seeing the same guy. Yes, you're seeing the same like top stars, but you're not seeing like this person every week or that person every week. So I think it's one of those things where it's not that they don't care about tag team wrestling. It's just they're shifting their focus on this or on that. And, you know, that's another reason I think it's great that they have things like dark and elevation because, Hey, we can't fit this on dynamite. Okay. We'll put it on this or this. Um, and then after that match, uh, Tony Schiavone came to the ring and interviewed the Pinnacle. Cash cut a really good short promo. Dax had some really good words to say, especially going as far as the marquee says professional wrestling and this isn't an SNL skit, which is obviously a dig at the segment between MJF and Jericho. And MJF, as angry as he could, um, just cut a really good promo and you know we've talked about it before he's one of those guys that uh, is really really good and you know like we've talked about he has a long future in this business and he's such a good heel like his heel persona is over the top but he really gets people invested in it I think MJF is like the greatest heel right now. I was talking to a buddy of mine who was saying the other day he thinks that Sinatra style bit that he did with Jericho ruined the entire him being the top heel in the business or being the best heel in the business, which I don't necessarily agree with. I mean, I hated that segment myself because you know I don't like all that singing and dancing stuff, but. Uh, I don't see it that way. It's one of those things where uh, I just think it was kind of to show, hey, this guy has more depth to his character. Right. I think that was the purpose of that segment, personally. Are you a comedic wrestling fan? Like, do you like comedy wrestling at all? It depends. So, like, I like I like Orange Cassidy. So I'd say so. Oh, God. I'm going to tell you, I, I've, it took me a couple years to get to come around on him, and I I'll tell you how I got into him. I was not, and, I, and I'm still not necessarily. Uh, I do own a Cassidy shirt, by the way, just for the record. But um, one of the things with that is I always, I hated stupid gimmicks like that. One of the things was his feud with Jericho. I became more interested in him than I did because I think that he was getting that rub from Jericho. You know what I mean? And the matches that he was putting on with Jericho. And and then I actually, you know, prior to that, I found out who he actually was, like, between his uh, his earlier career before becoming Orange Cassidy. Yeah, which I didn't realize until probably a couple months ago. I didn't know that until, you know, somebody told me that. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. So I researched it, and it was true. I'm just like, like I, was a huge, I was a huge Colony fan. I, I mean, I, it's funny because it's... um. He was fire ant, and I have a picture of my young, my oldest son. Where he bought, I bought him a fire ant replica mask at a Chikara show, like back in the day. 
And That's I have a picture of my son wearing it, my oldest son wearing it. And I came across that picture the other day. So it's very coincidental that it's just like, I didn't know that that was him until like, you know, however long he's been doing this Orange Cassidy. Video. Probably a couple of years now. But so then once I realized that, and I was like, that guy could actually work. You know what I mean? He's just a goofball in the ring. Yeah, but you know what? You have people like my dad, who's almost 60, and absolutely loves Orange Cassidy. To, like, the point, not only does he have the Orange Cassidy shirt, but he actually has, like, a similar jacket to Orange Cassidy. Oh, my God. So. Does he, uh... Your dad's been a wrestling fan his whole life, or for a yeah. good portion. Like my That's dad, awesome. my dad's one of those things where, like, he was telling me when he would go to like Central High School and see like Hogan and Andre wrestle. Yeah, I've heard some great stories about stuff like that. Like he tells me all these stories, like about how, like, and this was like pre. I think this was pre WWF. WWF with the extra W, maybe. I, I don't I don't remember, but like he would tell me stories like about seeing that and see that's the cool thing like about the indie shows, it's the same thing, but um yeah. you know, someone like Orange Cassidy, he reaches he reaches everybody. And right. you know, those are the type of people they need and you know, they put him in certain spots and he definitely proved, Hey, I belong here. Yeah, absolutely. The, the match that got me actually mm-hmm. Cassidy, which I had again no the car. I didn't know it was him, even though I had been to the car show. And uh, I saw it was all out 2019, the first all out. I went to uh, Game Changer Wrestling, two cups stuff. It was a really interesting card. Like you had Mance Warner versus Jerry the King Lawler, um, and you had Gang Realm versus Orange Cassidy which I think I've mentioned. It was really interesting. But uh, that was one of those things where, like, I even, I met him at that show, and, like, he's one of those dudes that's, like, he lives the gimmick, but, like, he's really good to bring. All right, so what else do we got here on the show before we wrap it up? Because we're going to need to wrap it up in a few minutes. So we have the Team Taz segment, which they're further teasing the split of Brian Cage. So Taz is like, hey, Brian Cage has apologized to me and Ricky Starks, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Cage, like, kind of rolled his eyes and was like, say what? And yeah, I saw that. Yep. Signature pose and goes, who's better than Cage? It's kind of one of those things where it's like, Team Taz is cool, but they're going to make Brian Cage a single star, and that's very obvious. It was a baby face runner in the works, basically. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's a guy that could really have a really great baby face run. Absolutely. And after that, you have... Uh, the, they've been teasing this whole QT Marshall thing for a few weeks, where he's been walking out on this and walking out on that, and basically QT cuts a promo... And it's like, Cody this, Cody this, Cody that, and he's sick of being under Cody's shadow. I, I get it. You know, it's it's a good story. And Cody says even though he doesn't really want to do it, he'll give him the match. Yeah, I think and that's going to be a good match. Do, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. But, you know, I also think they're slow burning to a Cody heel turn, possibly. <clears throat> um. That's something that I've been that have uh you're not the only one to mention that to me, but you're also it's uh it's something that's been like you said, a slow burn, but it's like certain people I think that I, I, I think that that's uh correct. And it's very possible that that's gonna happen very soon or down the road. Absolutely. And then after that segment you had the uh Young Bucks and Cutler. Versus Lucha Bros and Laredo Kid, which people have been clamoring for Laredo Kid to finally come back, especially because of like his history with Kenny. Um, as you know, like I love the Bucks, but like Ray Phoenix is on a whole nother level. Like 
you look at Ray Phoenix and it's like 96, 97 Ray Mysterio all over again. Like the dude is so athletic. Like it's insane. That, that guy is so insane. Like I, I've said this before. I think he's one of the best wrestlers in the modern era. Like he is, he just puts on phenomenal, phenomenal matches uh, every time he's out there. And, uh, I agree with you completely. And after the match was over, uh, Kenny came out, attacked the Rito kid, and uh, he basically cuts a promo about, did I, did I go to New York? Did you think I chose AEW? No, I chose AE. I never chose AEW. I chose the Bucks. And it's kind of one of those things where, like, I kind of feel like either Kenny's going full on heel and being a total dick. Or, you know, they're kind of teasing the Bucks something else and turning heel. It's kind of confusing because right. the Bucks the way at the end of the segment and they're like, we're done. And then when Kenny turned around after like having a freak out, the Lucha Brothers laid him out. Yes, I did see that part. That's, uh, I find that interesting, you know. It's really interesting to see what they're going to do with them, but you know, time will tell. It's another thing where it's a slow burn, and you don't know where they're going to go. But see, that's another thing too: is it's not predictable. Right. That's the other thing. Is like a lot of some things you are, can be pretty predictable. That AEW is a thing for doing it, where it's uh, uh, they slow burn things, so it's not necessarily too obvious and right out in the open. Yep. And then after that. I'm sure you saw we had a teaser air for Roots to the Top, which is going to be a reality show featuring Brandy and Cody. And, like, I know they're getting a lot of shit for it. Personally, like, I like to know more about the wrestlers' lives. I Like, you know, like, I love Dark Side of the Ring and stuff like that. And I understand it's reality TV. But I think it's going to be really cool. And, like, props to TNT for taking the chance on that. Um, but- I myself... I myself, I'm not a reality fan. My wife is a huge reality TV fan. So I may sit down and watch this and give it a try based on it's wrestling related. Like my wife does not watch wrestling, but she'll sit there and watch the show The Miz and His Wife, whatever the fuck that's called. Then there's another wrestling related one I don't remember uh, currently. So um, maybe she'll watch this and then, uh, you know, I'll watch it as well because... I'm going to give this a try. I'll definitely give it a try. Oh, absolutely. And then we had a another segment between Eddie Kingston and Mox, which they are absolute magic. Um, they just they have such good chemistry. And, you know, Moxley is talking about how he owes the Bucks, but he doesn't like any like owing anybody. And tells the Bucks, if you're going to be in the game, better be willing to get your hands dirty. So, obviously, they're going to end up teaming up to take on Kenny and the Good Brothers. Right. Which, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, you could do a swerve and have the Bucks turn full heel, or you could do something else. It'll be really interesting to see where they go with that. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Because I, I, I've said that I think that Eddie Kingston might turn. Uh, just... I mean, I don't know how if you see it at all. Uh, based just based on the fact that it's been one of those things like the I wouldn't say they teamed them up randomly, but it's it seems sort of random to the casual fan. I would say I would say, or or longtime fans, excuse me, longtime fans that like you know don't know you know might not know their history exactly about those two. Definitely, and um, following that. Two more matches on the card. You had Take Conti taking on Nyla Rose, which I actually, it was a really, really good match. Like, especially when Tay Conti was doing the judo throw to Nyla. I was like, wow. Like, Nyla did a really good job of selling for her. Um, they've done a really good job of, Tay Conti was very misused by WWE. She's like a phenomenal talent. She's like a legit badass. She's actually supposed to be making her MMA debut soon. I think it hasn't been announced, but she's been training. 
Um, I definitely think she's someone who got over really well. Um, she's really solid in the ring. She's a beautiful girl, and I definitely think they're positioning her to be one of the top people in the division. And you, especially having her beat Nyla the other night, you can see that, especially with how she went over. Right. I don't really remember much of this match. I think this is where I kind of got up and uh, I wasn't really paying attention to this one. I, I, I don't have an opinion. I'm sorry no, <laughs> for this match didn't. in particular. And then uh, to close off the night, we had the main event of the evening, Johnny Hungy, John Silver versus Darby Allen. This was a really, really good match. And I like, I know you're not like a big Silver fan. But. I'm not, uh, but I, uh, I'm coming around uh, because I'm starting to notice a lot more. Like, he is very talented. He's very funny. And I think they're teasing a baby face turn for him, if I'm not mistaken, or you know, him getting kicked out of the Dark Order. Unless I'm, you know, I think that that's what's coming. Um, he always seems to be the guy that they're leaving behind or just kind of bullying the rest of the guys. Uh I like this match. I thought it was phenomenal. And obviously, Silver injured himself in this match. Yeah, he uh, he took a really bad... In, in, you go back and watch the match, he took a really bad bump. He goes flying over the guardrail and lands on his shoulder, and it's like, oh boy, that looks like it hurt. He's going to be out for a while, for months, right? No, they said he's going to be out, I think, four to six weeks. It wasn't as bad as they originally thought. Okay, but but it was a nasty bump. But even during that match, Darby sold for him. Like you thought, Silver, win. but overall, it was it deserved to be the main event. Silver, they both deserved. Um, I just think with with Silver, I just think with Dark Order, I think they're all babyface at this point. I don't see him getting kicked out, but. I do see the partnership between uh, them and Hangman growing further. I could actually probably see Hangman and Silver tagging because of what they have going on. So it'll be really okay. interesting to see what they do with Silver because, you know, like Tony said, you know, hey, show more of, you know, this side of you on Dynamite. And, you know, last week when they did the whole oh, hey, who's who's going to challenge Darby? They all point to John, and it's like, okay, here's your time to shine, dude. Yeah, and yeah. When he's given time to shine, he delivers. Like, he is, for a small dude, another guy who's really small, He's really tiny. He's another guy that's really tiny. Just goes balls to the wall and just absolutely kills it every time he's in the ring. Yeah, I think that guy's awesome. I hope he, you know, four to six weeks, I hope he is uh, heals up, and I'm looking forward to him coming back. And we look forward to the what we talked about this week for upcoming Dynamite, obviously. We won't wait so long to talk about this week's Dynamite, if, I, if that came out right. We ended up waiting a few days. Yeah, we had, you know, there's just events happening. Wrestling, other wrestling was happening, and we want to try to get all of it in, so... Or as much as we can, and so, anyways, I'm looking forward to Dynamite this week. Tomorrow's Monday. It begins the new week of professional wrestling, so there's going to be a lot more covered this week. And we'll be back. Do you have Absolutely. anything? Anything you would like to close with? Just thanks for okay. tuning in, listening to me and Rick ramble. Ramble. Well, yeah, we went almost two hours. And look at that. That's pretty good. I haven't done a two-hour episode in almost a year. Alright, take care.